Next, we have Mr. Christian K. Meyer. Christian, are you here with us? I am, sure enough. Hello, sir. Good morning. Good morning. I emailed you, but I don't think you got it. I am slightly underwater and not able to re reply quickly. I've told everyone they have to call or text me at this point. So we are here today to talk about blockchain basics from invention to innovation. And Christian is very passionate. I cannot wait for him to share with you guys his, uh, his passions. All right, I give you the 90 second nickel tour first to put things into perspective mostly. So. My partner Carl and I, we have been technology investing for some 20 years. The funny accent you hear my voice originated in Germany. I was a software developer for a very short period of time at Siemens Nixdorf in the mid 80s, which doesn't mean much. I learned basics and nonsense like that. Eventually ended up going to law school. When I came out of law school, became general counsel for one of the very early internet service providers. Means we were selling dial-up services in the late 90s. And we lucked out to sell this company to what's now the largest internet service provider in Europe, Tiscali in 2000, so I promptly retired from the law and also moved to Southern California here to set up a venture fund. Our original focus was on voice of IP solution, multi-massive online player games, and a lot of people will probably see the similarities to the blockchain space specifically with MMOPGs already having in-game currencies with US dollar exchange rates since the mid 90s and um, voice of IP, the technology we are using here right now is also the most used peer-to-peer -peer solution in the world. So with that said, so my main pet peeve in that space is still that unfortunately reality doesn't have an advertising budget. So we have to read through a lot of, let's call it um, motivated reasoning to get to ground truth. So let me start off with just the simple things that people seem to ignore a lot today, which is just the original Bitcoin white paper real quick. So keep in mind what is, was its original title and then ask yourself whether or not we have that. Ask yourself what are the tenants of what's called a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system or cash in particular. So we'll go into those details, but I would encourage you to read it. And if you have read it already, read it again. So. What are the main inventions? So and how are inventions different from innovation? So proof of work wasn't an invention of the white paper. Then blockchain technology was also not an invention of the white paper. What was the invention? The invention was Byzantine fault tolerance by putting those two concepts together. What does Byzantine fault tolerance mean? Uh, in very simple terms, and again, I'm not gonna be very technical. I'm trying to be very practical when I explain things. It means in short that if you have a network that needs to be maintained by a number of people, you wanna assume that some of those people are malicious and you wanna implement a mechanism that dissuades them from being malicious and hence a consensus mechanism that encourages everybody to work towards the same outcome. Hence, when you talk about a decentralized network, this is not the same as distributed network and people still seem to confuse the two. Decentralization is not necessarily obviously an absolute, it works on the scale. So even if there was one node operating the software, actually it was probably not at all in that particular operator's um, interest to actually be malicious, obviously, because immediately everybody would stop that using this particular network. All right, these were the innovations. So what did Satoshi introduce? He introduced self-executing code. And um, that's confusingly oftentimes referred to as smart contracts. Needless to say, these contracts are not smart at all. They are mostly kind of if-then statements. If you know basics, or oh, basic, you know what I'm talking about. And um, I like to refer to them as the building blocks for digital vending machines, a concept I'm gonna talk about a little later. So, Secondly, and that's built on self-executing code, is digital bearer instrument. So there's two different types, one being blockchain natives, these are coins, typically reward mechanisms, and protocol based, which are called tokens, i.e. the ERC20 token on uh, Ethereum's mainnet. And then lastly, and that would probably prove to be the most important innovation um, at last, is the decentralized autonomous organization. Unfortunately, I probably won't be able to get much into that. It's very 
bar down the presentation chain here, but I would encourage you to learn more about it. So it's um, significant uh, by on-chain governance and the alignment, most important of stakeholders, which differentiates it from current capital formation um, systems such as for-profit corporations. So what is the problem? There's a lot of confusion still what problem we are trying to solve. And that's why we have a lot, i.e. thousands and thousands of tokens. So people have identified banks and money technologies as the problem. Is that really the problem? So now we got a slew of tokens. Here's just a few. They are not the solution. What do I mean by that? The problem is the conflation of function. If you went to business school, you probably at one point in time encountered this definition of money, money uh, being a medium of exchange, a unit of account, a store of value. That was a definition introduced by a gentleman called Javance in 1876. Well, in 1876, there was also another gentleman that introduced some new technology and he introduced this funny instrument, which was a telephone. Um, needless to say, telephones don't look like this anymore. Neither do money technologies. Excuse so, me, Christian. I'm so, I'm really sorry, but are you sharing your? I, I, are you showing a presentation? Because I don't see a screen share. Oh, I hear you clicking. wow! Someone should have told me earlier. I, yeah, I heard you clicking. I'm sorry. Lapping away at my presentation, and no one is seeing it. Wow, that is embarrassing. Let me fix that right away. You missed out on all the funny images I created. So I'm going to share that later again. <laughs> and we fix yeah, thank that you, sir. Editing, I assume. <laughs> all right. But again, you didn't miss all that much yet. So what we're talking about right now, what is money technology today? Well, actually, most money technology today are DLTs. DLTs are the opposite of blockchain. So what happens when you send funds from one bank to another, let's say you have an account of Bank of No Returns, and you want to send Lisa at Chase Me If You Can Bank some dollars. What happens is you instruct Bank of No Returns to adjust your ledger, or their ledger actually, and then if you're lucky, Lisa's bank account or Lisa's ledger is gonna be adjusted with that same amount the next day, maybe, which tells you it's a DLT or more specifically, it's a federated DLT because intermittently the banks will have to reconcile with the Federal Reserve System. What it also tells you that the default medium of exchange are bytes. There have been bytes for decades. 97% of all values signified by bytes. So if you're looking at your wallet right now, what you see is you have your Bitcoin holdings, your Ether holdings and so forth. And what do you see? You see a translation. You see, see a translation in the language of money you understand. In our case, most likely the US dollar, but if you're in another country, you might as well say euros, you might as well see yens. Did the Bitcoin change? It didn't. So what this tells you is money is language, is the language of value. So what's your job as a technologist? What need to invent? If you know the symbol, then you've seen and or read the Hitchhiker's Guide to the, the galaxy, galaxy. It's the Babelfish. It translates seamlessly from one language to another. This is your task. I'm going to go into this a little later. So what is not to do? We don't expect that users will adapt a new language, as in the new language of money being, for example, Bitcoin. If you expect to see a Bitcoin price on your banana, you're sorely mistaken, you're wasting your time. As a technology inventor, what you don't want to do is expect users to adapt your technology. You adapt your technology to the user. So what does that mean? Specifically, I like to use this particular example. Smart contracts, or how I like to call them, self-executing code, lend themselves to build what I would call a digital vending machine. Here's how your typical vending machine works. You approach it with your coin or your, your printed US dollar, you push it into a slot, you pick uh, from the candy bar, uh, push the button, candy comes out, and no intermediary was needed. Uh, there's no additional fees attached to that transaction. You got, just get your result. Smart contracts, self-executing code, allows you to do the same thing in the digital world or buy it. 
we need to still build a lot of on and off ramps. All the value is in the on and off ramps to these systems. I'm going to show you later why. So, money over IP. I used that term in the past. I've backed off from that because money is actually friction. What do I mean by that? The default language of money today for a user is typically the local fiat he, she is indoctrinated in. In the United States, you're indoctrinated into the US dollar and so forth. So what that means is though, whenever you hold this fiat instrument, you're losing value, you're losing purchasing power due to inflation because there's always gonna be more of it and never gonna be less of it. Inflation is a little more complex, it's own topic. It's actually not how most people understand it. It's very, very sectional. Either way, what your job is, is to build value transfer protocols that do not hold on to inflationary instruments. Should be obvious, is not being practiced at the moment. So tokenizing the world, battle cry I've been hearing for four or five years already, not so much. Again, missing on and off ramps. Can you tokenize a house? It's a metaphor, you can't tokenize a house. When you take a picture of a house, you didn't digitize it, right? You took a picture of the house. It's a metaphor. Metaphors don't lend themselves well to build solid technology. You want to actually learn the specific vocabulary of the space, which is rather new and still rather confusing to most. So non-fungibles, I'm going to touch on it really, really shortly. Um, the most prominent example is this one of the broken crypto kitty here. This one sold for apparently $440,000. And we have seen a lot of proposals to do the same with in-game items. Unfortunately, none of these have materialized in a larger form at this point in time. In my personal opinion, that's mostly because there haven't been advancements on top of 721. So if you're looking at the non-fungible standard, the most prominent being the Ethereum 721 standard, it doesn't provide all that much utility. Essentially, you're buying an entry on a blockchain, but all the metadata, all the information that this particular item carries are still stored somewhere else, right? And so we need to fix that. So assets of IP, that's a very, very interesting concept and should also signify why we need more on and off ramps. So I can create an item simply on the blockchain, let's simplify it through a QR code, associate that to a real world item. And so in the past, in one of our meetups, we make up this example, which I still want to see in the real world is that of a virtual wine bottle. So I can associate that wine bottle with this particular entry. I can transfer it using the Ethereum blockchain as one example, moving on, tracking its provenance and so forth on another network like the Stellar network. Uh, actually, that was not Stellar, but okay. And then eventually it will end up hopefully at some point of sales system, at which point in time it might seamlessly move into my virtual wine seller app. So I just hold the token at this point in time, but I have the rights to hold a particular wine bottle. All right, I'm rushing through this real quick to have most time left for um, frequently asked questions or EMA, whatever you wanna call it. But this is probably one of the most important concepts that we focus on right now, as in for most of value transfer that's not digitally native, you need to identify the parties. And right now, the, most of the time, this is done through processes like KYC and so forth that end up in someone's database. Needless to say, that removes the peer-to-peer -peer character that we are looking for in order of asset transfers and introduces simply new middlemen that now enforce their rent seeking. And that's not the intent of what we're trying to build here. Identity is its own very, very long topic. Identity is most likely not going to be solved on a blockchain. It's most likely going to be addressed by graph-based solutions. It's very important to understand that decentralized software is not limited to blockchains. It's also graph, which are utterly different and don't store entries. On that note, the ledger of a blockchain is somewhat of an optional element, as in the public ledger is an optional element, because the initial introduction was mainly to prove that the transfer was complete. And oftentimes people think it's a requirement. It's really not. It's important to know. Anyway, so DAOs. DAOs address a problem that we have right now. So we have corporations, we have INCs, we have LLCs, and what do they do? They're trying to align 
multiple stakeholders. You got operators, you got employees, you got clients, you got suppliers, you got shareholders, and they have all somewhat separate interests, should be obvious. The main purpose of a for profit corporation is to increase shareholder value. And to increase shareholder value, it will adopt a business model. My favorite example to pick on because it's the most obvious one is if you're using Google, you might call yourself a user, but you're actually the product that Google is selling to its actual uh, uh, clients, which are the advertisers. So you are the product that Google is selling to the advertisers. Also, since Google and well, Alphabet now is a for-profit corporation, its main objective is not to provide the best search result to its users. Its main objective is to increase shareholder value. And the way it does it is by selling advertising. And the way it does it is selling you to the advertiser at the end of the day. So specifically in the search, you can see how this is not gonna create the most optimal outcome, but that's also true for many, many other organizations. So in a DAO, uh, you probably know that, and Bitcoin being the most obvious and probably the most relevant DAO, you create ideally an alignment of the shareholders and the stakeholders in, in particular. So if you're buying into the network by buying a coin or buying the token, you participate in the network. So your interests are aligned with everybody else participating in the network, whether or not it's a node operator or someone else creating and um, taking assets from it. So what does that do? Well, it's gonna disrupt a whole lot of things. And um, I think one of the first things to be disrupted are rent-seeking instruments such as what we call the sharing economy. Like sharing economy today means mostly you're sharing your profits with a corporation, right? Your Airbnbs, your Ubers of the world that extract 15 or 25% of the revenue that its members quote unquote generate. So we already see the beginnings of decentralized systems that facilitate the exact same purpose. And obviously with any transaction, you typically have another middleman, i.e. a credit card that also gets to attract, uh, 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 distract two to three percent of the value being moved. So what's missing? Today, we are running internet protocol, we're running file transfer protocol, we're running TCP IP and a lot of other protocols that make up what we call the World Wide Web. Well, actually, we never built the World Wide Web. We built the commercial web. It's being controlled by access by very few corporations and by fewer corporations for uh, directing eyeballs. So what we're building right now is, well, I call, I still have this manual IP in here. I'm gonna have to take that out, but we're building value and asset over IP protocols, and then eventually something resembling identity over IP protocols, at which point in time I would call it web 1.0. So if you have been in the space for some time, at one point in time, you came across this particular graphic, which is unfortunately utterly wrong. It was called initially the, the Fed protocol, as in the value is being created on the protocol level. That is obviously not true because the value is created, always will be created on the application and on an offering um, layer, not on the protocol. So what are the addressable markets? This is part of a very big, big outline that I have on a whiteboard that takes up my entire wall. We look at this in very large categories of value transfer. All of these value transfer categories provide opportunities to startups in that space right now. They might be different in size. My personal prognosis said is that things such as remittance and cash payments will actually end up being uh, user acquisition tools for companies providing additional services on top of it, but not um, extracting money from the actual payments or remittance itself. All right, there's further reading, but I rushed through this with a purpose. So now I'd like to open it up to any questions you guys might have. That was super fast. Okay, I put everybody to sleep. Sorry, Christian, one moment. I'm checking to make sure that everyone can get off mute here. Okay. We're gonna have to re-record uh, for Coin Genius University. My apologies for that introduction here. 
Um, Jeremy or anyone on the team, if you guys can uh, hit the correct buttons, I just want to, I've unmuted everyone. Hopefully everyone can join in now. <laughs> well, there's, uh, there's obviously a lot to unpack here. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I know how you feel about the uh, the future. I know when you're talking about crypto current, uh, crypto kitty specifically in the future of ownership and digital assets, that becomes really interesting. That was a huge topic yesterday. Um, so I'd love to hear anybody who has any thoughts or questions around that, or maybe even Christian, you can talk on that specifically because I think you were well suited also for that panel, but didn't get a chance. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we spend a lot of time on that topic. We, we talked probably to every team in that space that is working on the non-fundable token. I'm still bullish about the concept in general, not so much about uh, the particular application at this point in time. This comes back to that our theories, it's all about um, the on and off ramps, specifically the, the topic of um, in-game items. It doesn't seem that the usual suspects are very interested in actually executing on that as in the, the main providers of um, the popular games aren't really taken by that idea that their in-game items could be transferred from, from user to user and are being used in, in other environments, right? Got it. So, I mean, do you think uh, Tops and Tops Digital, I know we had uh, somebody from there um, talking yesterday, they had a really great debut with the Garbage Pail Kids on the Wax blockchain. I mean, do you see Wax as a key player here? It seems like more and more folks in large companies are utilizing their protocols to launch these digital collectibles. Oh yeah, I mean, we've known those guys for quite some time. We like them a lot. We, we think that their heart's in the right place. It's likely still way too early. And what I mean by that is, I, I think the protocols are not nuanced enough to, to carry actual value on, on the protocol level at this point in time. Right? We need a lot more fundamental technology to be built for those to be useful because what's the value of a, an entry on, on a chain if you still have to revert back to what's mostly still um, centralized databases of sorts, but even if you look at IPFS, it's actually not decentralized, right? We, that is a topic by itself. Christian, what do you, um, can you give the summary of your uh, position, the number of coins we should have is between zero and one? <laughs> yes, uh, so yeah, that's, uh, kind of, uh, as you guys know, my, my most like passionate point because uh, the problems that we see with, with current uh, value transfer systems, if you will, including the topic of money itself, it's the conflation of functions. These functions have been separated, however, a long time ago, right? So to kind of reunite those functions, it's a huge mistake. Even like Bitcoin itself, the function is of being a mining reward, right? People speculate on the mining reward that is the lowercase b Bitcoin. So Bitcoin is actually still missing. Um, a, it didn't achieve its main goal, but B is still missing, if you will, the minting function, if you want to use the metaphor of mining. There never was a minting function. So in that sense, it kind of failed this objective because obviously you cannot move um, Bitcoins for free or without a time delay. But more importantly right now, it's also not very anonymous. So those are the tenants that you require from an actual peer-to-peer -peer cash solution. But as far as, as new tokens are concerned, whenever you conflate functions, i.e. it's a reward mechanism for running a node, but it's also supposed to so, so, uh, solve payment, it will not work, period, right? We, we know that because it comes back to simply what you want to use for payment, the main two things here for users, do I understand it as in, is it like the US dollar? That's why you always see the translation into the US dollar. And is it quote unquote stable? So as soon as you have another function in there, it ends up being not stable. As soon as you put another label on there, you have to explain what that label means in my um, unit of value. There is A, no need to conflate those functions and B, it only introduces friction, including money itself being friction. So my point there being is you actually need to at all costs avoid anything that's inflationary and plus all of these items today are simply speculative. I look at the um, quote unquote cryptocurrency market, which is a terrible, terrible term in and of itself that has a, caused a lot of unwanted attention for the space that we didn't need. But if you look at the space, 
there's hardly any connection to real life economic activity, quite obviously at this point in time, comes back to we don't have the on and on, uh, on and off ramps for that. The point there being the state of cryptocurrencies is very much that of a multi-massive online player game. And I don't mean this disparaging. I think that should have happened with any financial system around the world. We didn't do that, but you have to realize that this is what the state is. So Christian, let me ask you one last question. Oh, uh, I've got one for him too. Okay, great. <laughs> yeah, so no, I, hey guys, if I could just say, Christian, I really appreciate it. I, I, you're definitely preaching to the choir. Um, although we disagree that the uh, sovereign identity can't be on the blockchain, um, but that's a whole different discussion. It is. Uh, but I just wanted to say, yeah, fantastic. Uh, I, you, we, you read right along with us. That was, that was great. Thanks. Well, thanks, Mike. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, the one question I had specifically is around, you talk about anywhere from zero to one in terms of cryptocurrencies that are needed specifically. So let's just go back to WAX, right? Because I think this is a really important point. And once again, we only have like three minutes. So whatever the best answer you can give me in three minutes would be, um, why is WAX important and why can WAX do what they're doing and help some of these large companies create these digital assets? And why is that important versus their token? And what's the difference and why in your opinion is the token in those types of scenarios not needed okay uh many different things here so uh, a i need to touch base with malcolm uh, i've known for some time and so I'll, I'll see what they have worked on lately to be honest i haven't looked at it lately but again it, it simply comes down to the conflational function if you expect that people were to use your token as a payment function a that's a huge mistake to begin with don't ever expect that right use it for for something else right plus also whenever you start out issuing a token why would you ever start with any form of fixed supply how is that ever gonna resemble any type of incentive in your system right it, it's you already set the monetary policy forever and you don't actually know before you start the network how this monetary policy will work out on the network participants which usually obviously it doesn't bitcoin kind of sort of got it right right but it's also been out there the longest and been tested in the wild and kind of had the chance to develop itself but whenever you just presuppose i mint a billion token and uh, I use this thing for payment and many other functions, you're, you're just committing an awful, awful mistake of conflating the functions that have been the bane of our existence to begin with our current monetary system where it's being used to influence the economy at large rather than simply functioning its original intent, which is as, as technology, which points to the main conflation here, which is, currencies are systems of value transfer money is one particular technology you're using within that system christian i have a quick follow-up question so i consider you an expert on all things point of sale i know that you've invested in the btc atms what are your thoughts on products like joff paradise's cryptomatic atm well, I love the concept overall because, I mean, the original shitcoin is really fiat, if you will, right? And we need to suck out the original shitcoin out of the existing system to eventually move those to actual value transfer. Again, that doesn't mean that you create a new unit of account, right? But yeah, um, big fan of anything that's an on and off ramp. And since a lot more transactions are still facilitated by cash and a lot more people than you would think live in cash based societies, uh, I think those kind of automated um, uh, vending machines of sorts for money are utterly needed. And I, I actually see more versus less intermittently, but they have to get smart. Awesome. And in terms of uh, payment on and off ramps from uh, from ATM machines, where do you feel the next evolution of on and off ramps and uh, and mass adoption, lowering the barrier to entry? Where do you feel the next evolution will be? Well, you need to focus on the nuances here. We already have systems that simulate the real time transfer of uh, value, and by that I mean settlement. Unfortunately. Um, within the payment industry, they don't even use it accurately, in, including the people that are working on, at scale at this. So the, the settlement part, i.e. if you're looking at Zelle, to you as a user seems to be instant. It's actually not. There's another layer in between. But you need to achieve the same thing because 
Um, our system here in the United States is uh, more antiquated than uh, some of the other international systems. They already have layers that, are, uh, that mean instant settlement. And just as a frame of reference, so the, the payment sector itself right now creates about $2 billion of alpha every year. And most of that alpha, most of that profit is being created for banks specifically. 30% of the revenue of that banks made is coming from payment. So that's the low hanging fruit in my opinion. Specifically, focus on the on and off ramps that let you move value for free. And that value can be expressed in the unit of account that people are understanding, but it doesn't have to be the same thing as it doesn't have to touch your bank account at all, quite obviously, right? The, your house doesn't change if you price it in, in dollar versus yen or in, in Bitcoin for that matter. So most of accounting entries, right, don't represent simple fiat. I mean, that's just uh, M1, M2. Everything else re represents something else, right? It re represents a, a part of a, a mortgage or, or whatever it is. So that's the more important part to realize. What is that entry representing? We have equanimity in terms of the, the transfer level. You just need to realize the current technology is databases. The new right. technology is blockchain or decentralized software is the better term in this context based. And there, the bytes just move much faster and just don't need the middleman. That's the focus you need to have because again, the unit of account doesn't matter. The medium of exchange is simply bytes. Keep that in mind. Don't call Bitcoin a new medium of exchange. That's, that's just nonsense. Thank you, Christian. Thank you so much for being a part of Coin Genius University. We are proud to welcome you as a professor. For folks that want to get in touch with you and learn more um, or dig deeper into any of the topics that you brought up today, how do people get a hold of you? Uh, don't get a hold of me. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, so we typically publish something on Forbes every month or every other month or so that kind of pinpoints what we consider our thesis on the space in, in very short articles because they limit me to a thousand words. So what I typically do, I republish these articles on Hacker Noon and um, warning ahead. So I publish these for peer review, right? As in, if I'm wrong, I want to know about this sooner than later. And then also I will update those where I can, as in I can update them on Hacker when I can't update them on Forbes as I glean new insights. So some of these articles, in this case, I've been updating for the past five years. Okay, but, very but good. But again, it's well, all, it's all uh, strong opinions, weekly, hey, uh, weekly held, as people say, right? And, and that's okay in our book. So for those of you that want to get a hold of Christian, uh, reach out to me through the Genius Network. We will vet you. And if it's worth Christian's time, I will bug him. Christian, thank you so much for joining us today. It was a pleasure to have you. Up next, we have...